Okay, are we having a party and am I invited? All right, great. Uh, so good afternoon. Um, uh, just a few things at the top and then happy to take your questions. First, the Department of Defense continues to support interagency Hurricane Helene recovery efforts with North Carolina National Guard and FEMA in the lead. More than 6,700 National Guardsmen from 16 states have been spearheading recovery efforts across the Southeast region in support of their governors, providing critical aid to those impacted by this storm's devastation. Additionally, as we've said in our statement yesterday, Secretary Austin has authorized 1,000 active duty troops from Fort Liberty to assist FEMA in these response efforts. The department will continue to be fully engaged with FEMA and our federal, state, and local partners to ensure we are supporting and coordinating recovery efforts. Shifting gears, Secretary Austin spoke by phone to his Ukrainian counterpart, Defense Minister Umerov, today. The two leaders discussed current battlefield dynamics and security assistance priorities. Minister Umerov also provided an update on Ukraine's operations, battlefield, and capability needs. A full readout will be available on defense.gov later today. Looking ahead to tomorrow, Secretary Austin will travel to Scott Air Force Base to preside over the U.S. Transportation Command Change of Command Ceremony where General Jacqueline Van Ovost will relinquish command to General Randall Reed. I won't get ahead of the Secretary's remarks, but the Department is very grateful to General Van Ovost for her decades of honorable service to the Air Force, the Department of Defense, and to our nation. The ceremony and the Secretary's remarks will be live streamed on defense.gov tomorrow. Shifting gears again, this past weekend, the Royal Australian Navy, the Royal Australian Air Force, the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force, the Royal New Zealand Navy, the Armed Forces of the Philippines, and the U.S. Navy conducted a maritime cooperation cooperative activity within the Philippines' exec, exclusive economic zone in the South China Sea. Exercises like this demonstrate the strength of relationship between partners and allies and enhance cooperation, interoperability, and combined capabilities in the maritime domain, contributing to peace, stability, and uphold. Okay, are we having a party and am I invited? All right, great. Uh, so good afternoon. Um, uh, just a few things at the top and then happy to take your questions. First, the Department of Defense continues to support interagency Hurricane Helene recovery efforts with North Carolina National Guard and FEMA in the lead. More than 6,700 National Guardsmen from 16 states have been spearheading recovery efforts across the Southeast region in support of their governors, providing critical aid to those impacted by this storm's devastation. Additionally, as we've said in our statement yesterday, Secretary Austin has authorized 1,000 active duty troops from Fort Liberty to assist FEMA in these response efforts. The department will continue to be fully engaged with FEMA and our federal, state, and local partners to ensure we are supporting and coordinating recovery efforts. Shifting gears, Secretary Austin spoke by phone to his Ukrainian counterpart, Defense Minister Umerov, today. The two leaders discussed current battlefield dynamics and security assistance priorities. Minister Umerov also provided an update on Ukraine's operations, battlefield, and capability needs. A full readout will be available on defense.gov later today. Looking ahead to tomorrow, Secretary Austin will travel to Scott Air Force Base to preside over the U.S. Transportation Command Change of Command Ceremony, where General Jacqueline Van Ovost will relinquish command to General Randall Reed. I won't get ahead of the Secretary's remarks, but the Department is very grateful to General Van Ovost for her decades of honorable service to the Air Force, the Department of Defense, and to our nation. The ceremony and the Secretary's remarks will be live streamed on defense.gov tomorrow. Shifting gears again, this past weekend, the Royal Australian Navy, the Royal Australian Air Force, the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force, the Royal New Zealand Navy, the Armed Forces of the Philippines, and the U.S. Navy conducted a maritime cooperation cooperative activity within the Philippines' exec, exclusive economic zone in the South China Sea. Exercises like this demonstrate the strength of relationship between partners and allies and enhance cooperation, interoperability, and combined capabilities in the maritime domain, contributing to peace, stability, and upholding the freedom of navigation and overflight in the Indo-Pacific region. Of note, 
This was the first time New Zealand participated, and it shows that cooperation represents the centerpiece of our approach to our secure, to a secure and more prosperous region where aircraft and ships of all nations may fly, sail, and operate anywhere that international law allows. And finally, well, actually, I have one more thing. So second to last thing. Uh, in an effort to reduce out-of-pocket expenses for service members and their families on permanent change of station orders, earlier this week, the department launched a new pilot program that will reimburse active duty service members for the transportation expenses of a child care provider when child care isn't available at military-operated child development center at a new permanent duty station within 30 days of their reporting date. Service members may be reimbursed up to $500 for PCS moves between CONUS locations and up to $1,500 for moves to or from locations outside the continental United States, including Alaska and Hawaii, and U.S. territories and possessions for travel costs of a child care provider. Taking care of people is a priority for Secretary Austin and the Department of Defense, and this program reflects our ongoing effort to learn, listen, and lead on issues that are critical to meeting the unique challenges of military life. And for more information, please visit military child Chair. I'm so sorry. Please visit militarychildcare.com. And before we move on to questions, I just want to say happy birthday to Mr. Chris Garver, who did not want to be celebrated, but everyone should go say happy birthday to him later today. All right. With that, happy to turn to questions. Tara. All right. Uh, thanks, Sabrina. I'm surprised that uh, there wasn't an Israel topper in there. And just wondering, um, have you had any additional <coughs> conversations with the Israelis on the this tension that we are seeing right now. We've got thousands of extra service members in the region. What's going on with them? Are they, you know, shift, are you shifting force posture? You know, it seems like this is kind of a waiting game at this point. So in terms of, um, you know, what our forces in the Middle East are doing right now, their mission hasn't changed. They're there, um, you know, to protect U.S. forces in the region um, if called upon for the defense of Israel. But um, as you saw, uh, that was put into into place on October 1st when Iran launched another attack against Israel. Our forces, of course, stood with the IDF and, and the operation and, you know, engaged um, you know, nearly 200 ballistic missiles that were fired from Iran. Um, so the mission hasn't changed. Um, they continue to operate within the AOR um, and, you know, will continue to do so. I, I'm sorry, what was your follow-on question? It just seems like right now there's this very tense moment of mm -hmm. waiting to see what Israel's response will be. What is this building doing right now to help tamper down that tension? And if it doesn't, if Israel doesn't listen, is the secretary prepared to send U.S. troops to combat to defend Israel? Well, that's something that the president has spoken about. Um, we're not looking for a wider regional conflict. We're not seeking war with any um, group or organization or country in the region. Um, you know, we continue to engage the Israelis, you know, very frequently. Uh, we are certainly talking to them about their response, but what their response might be, I'm just not going to speculate further on. But we do continue to engage with them. Um, and I'll just have to leave it at that. Jen. Um, Sabrina, how many of the 12 interceptors that were fired from the U.S. warships actually engaged and intercepted bl the ballistic missiles fired from Iran? So we're still doing our own assessment, so I just don't have um, exact numbers to provide right now. And how much would that have cost, 12 interceptors, and do those ships now need to resupply? Um, and then I have a follow-up. Sure. So in terms of resupply um, and, and cost, you know, that's something that I think I'd I think CENTCOM should really speak to, or I'm sorry, or um, UCOM um, and, and Sixth Fleet. I just don't have those numbers readily in front of me right now. Um, so I'd, I'd defer to them on, on cost and, and resupply. But as you know, our sh ships move in and out of ports. They get retrofitted, resupplied um, at any given time. So I would assume as they expended some of those interceptors, eventually they would have to get, um, you know, backfilled. But in terms of their movements, I'd refer you to Sixth Fleet. But is there some discussion of maybe needing a supplemental? Because I believe that President Biden's um, defense requests this year did not have money for missile defense. I'm not tracking additional um, requests for a supplemental. That doesn't mean that something couldn't happen down the road. But at this moment, I'm just not tracking anything additional. Um, you know, we are three days into operating under a continuing resolution. We still don't have our FY25 budget passed. Um, so the biggest full, port, full court press from this building is, of course, urging Congress to pass um, 
an appropriations bill so we don't have to operate under the supplemental, I mean, sorry, this continuing resolution, um, you know, that's what we're, that's something that's top of mind for this building and we're gonna continue to engage with Congress on that. Patrice. Uh, you sort of hinted at this when you said the U.S. would help defend Israel, um, but, but more specifically, will the U.S. military take part in any offensive operation, Israeli operations against Iran? So what I can tell you, Idris, is, you know, we're certainly consulting with Israel um, and talking to them about their response, but I'm just not going to go any further than that. Rule out the U.S. military could take part. I'm just not going to go any further than what I have. And then, uh, the Secretary and Defense mm -hmm. Minister Gallant speak regularly, but there have been many instant or a number of instances in the past where Minister Gallant has not notified the Secretary um, before a major operation, most recently um, the killing of Nasrallah. Why do you believe um, the Israelis will share with you what they're going to do before they do it this time? Well, we've been in pretty much the last two weeks almost daily conversations, not every day, but almost daily. Um, in those conversations, you know, without going into um, the details of what all is shared, we do receive updates on, you know, some of their plans and operations. Um, you know, to your point, we were caught off guard by the strike on Nasrallah, but that doesn't mean that we are, you know, on, on other operations. Um, they're going to continue to, con you know, call and, and speak to each other. Um, you know, we don't get a heads up on every single operation that they're conducting every single day, but there are certainly, um, you know, I think a, a good relationship with the, between Minister Gallant and the Secretary, and um, they're going to continue to engage with each other. Expect to get notified if they attack Iran. I think I can tell you that we are talking to them about their response. I think the president spoke to this as well, um, you know, without without characterizing his words. Um, but, you know, I, I certainly think that um, any response um, from Israel to Iran, um, you know, we will be part of those discussions. Joseph. Thanks. Um, on the Israeli invasion in Lebanon, after for about eight or nine months of the department saying they were against any type of uh, ground operations or invasions um, over the weekend, that stance changed. Um, now the department is saying that they support limited operations from what they understand the Israelis are doing. What is limit? I mean, we've seen this before in, in Gaza. What is it that's limited for you guys? Um, at what point do you push back and say this is no longer limited? This might be against U.S. interest and potentially Israeli interest for whatever they're trying to do. Um, because we've also had, we reported that U.S. officials are saying that it needs to remain limited or else they'll lose, uh, they could lose U.S. support. So I, you know, um, to characterize what they're doing along that northern border is what what we see is and how we assess is it's limited in the scope is in the scope and scale and what they've said to us is that they're going after um you know hezbollah infrastructure that is along that border where you know israeli communities are um and you know we understand that um, the strategic purpose of this is so that Hezbollah cannot maintain the capacity um, to attack Israeli communities right there at that border in that short range. Um, look, we're still going to have these conversations with them. Right now, what we are observing and assessing is that these are limited in, in terms of the, the types of operations and how they're being conducted, as well as the people. You know, different militaries conduct operations you know, differently than the United States, just as we do, you know, separately from, from other militaries all around the world. But our assessment still remains that these are limited in scope and scale right now. And then just one more. Mm -hmm. um, is it fair to say that there's any type of disconnect between the secretary and the NSC or other agencies of the Biden administration in terms of uh, how they agree or, or what, what the secretary believes is the best way to go forward um, with whatever military operations they're carrying out? I'm not seeing any, um, you know, uh, differences between uh, the White House or this building. Um, the secretary is in regular communication with the NSC and with the president, um, having spoken to him, you know, this week and weeks previously during this time. Um, I don't see any daylight between the Pentagon or the NSC. Tom. Thanks, Sabrina. Uh, two questions. Um, this morning, President Biden was asked um, if he supports Israel striking Iranian oil facilities. He gave a little bit, it was no noisy, I think, he gave a little bit of a um, mumbled, uh, not very clear answer. He said, we're discussing that. Um, to be clear, is the Pentagon talking to the Israelis about striking Iranian oil facilities? 
Yeah, so Tom, as you can appreciate, I'm just uh, I'm not going to be able to go beyond what I've already said, which is that we are discussing with them what a response to Iran could look like. But detailing um, out from here what potential targets might look like, I just don't think that uh, serves a purpose or is really that helpful. Okay, thanks. And second question, um, there's a growing sense of a double standard regarding evacuations. Where is the U.S. rush to evacuate Americans from Israel? Americans in Lebanon have for the most part been told to find their own way out. I know it's a State Department decision. Um, but could you reassure Americans in Lebanon that U.S. military is on hand to help them evacuate if needed? Well, Tom, not to just you know push back a bit on that question, but one, it is it is the State Department request to um, you know issue some type of military assisted departure or a type of neo. Um, it also has to do with the demand, and if there is a demand signal for that. Right now, the embassy in Beirut continues to operate on regular hours, um, is still open. Um, there are still, my understanding is that there are still commercial options available to American citizens yeah, to get out. Seven, eight grand. Yeah, well, I, I believe today, at, um, my colleague at the State Department was just briefing that there are tickets uh, available in the hundreds that um, can be purchased, or if someone cannot afford that ticket, there is a loan given to them that that can be repaid over time. So, I, I mean, some of this is, you know, better directed towards the State Department. So um, they can explain some of the, um, you know, policies and procedures that are put in place. I, I think what I would urge you to look at, Tom, though, is from the very beginning or from very early on, you know, we've the State Department has issued travel warnings against traveling to Lebanon, encouraging um, American citizens in Lebanon to get out via commercial options. Um, the U.S. military is, of course, on on the ready and has a whole wide range of plans. Um, should we need to evacuate American citizens out of Lebanon, we absolutely can, and they can be implemented. Um, we haven't been called to do that. Uh, so, of course, we remain ready and we'll be in touch with our state colleagues, but that's not something that, um, you know, is being, is being considered right now. Yeah. Thank you, Sabrina. Mm -hmm. When you say uh, you're talking to the Israelis about their response, mm -hmm. does that mean that you are coordinating the details of the response, the scope? Not necessarily. Um, what do you mean by talking to the Israelis? Sure. So I think uh, without going into private conversations, what I can tell you, it's more about trying to understand what what their response might be. Um, I'm just not going to be able to go into further details than that. Okay, when you when you are trying to understand what mm -hmm. the response is going to be, uh, are you confident that the Israelis uh, will 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 give you a notice in advance uh, when and where the response is going to take place? Yeah. So, Joe, or they're going to keep you in the dark. What I can tell, well, I th you know. Great question. Same question that Idris asked me. Uh, my answer has not really changed. Well, let me let me let me then try and tackle this different question. Um, so, in terms of advance notice, we are in. We are talking to them about their response. I'm just not going to be able to go into more details than that. Um, in terms of the you know advance notice, again, we're we're talking to them. In terms of targets, what they might, you know, what a response might look like, those aren't things that I'm just going to detail from the podium, and frankly, not going to go into additional private conversations. Okay, last one, last sure. thing is uh, just I'm trying to understand. So you're talking to the Israelis because you are concerned that their response could escalate the the, the situation in the region, or you're talking to them because. You are. You have plans in advance to assist them in their response. So I think what the president has said is that um, you know Israel has a right to respond. I, I would remind you that um, on October first we saw two, nearly two hundred ballistic missiles launched towards Israeli territory with the atten intention um, to kill innocent civilians, to do damage to infrastructure, and. Um, because of the incredible coordination between the United States and the Israeli military, we were effective in, you know, combating and, and, and mitigating damage and preventing, you know, um, uh, massive casualties from that attack. Um, so Iran did fail in its attack against Israel. Um, but I have to, you know, also remind you when it comes to 
how we're talking about you know, how Israel might respond. These are conversations. And these are conversations that don't just happen in 15 minutes. They happen over time. Um, the secretary has been regularly engaging Minister Gallant, you know, pretty much for the last two weeks, almost every day. Um, I'm not going to, while I'm not going to go into those detailed conversations, um, it's not something that just happens in a vacuum. It happens over conversations, not just here at this building, but across the interagency. And, and that includes the White House as well. Funny. Thank you, Sabrina. If I may ask just sure. uh, three questions, two related and one separate. Okay. On, on Iran, as a spokesperson for the uh, Pentagon, you can tell the American people whether the U.S. will take or support offensive action against sovereign nation that did not attack U.S., U.S. forces, or U.S. interests in the region, which is Iran. Don't you need an authorization from Congress? to be part of that? So what I can tell you, Fadi, is what we've said from the very beginning is that we don't seek a wider regional war and we definitely don't seek conflict with any country or group. That includes Iran. Um, when it comes to an Israeli response, we're talking to them about their response. Of course, as you know, we have U.S. forces in the region. Um, the Secretary's priority uh, from day one has always been to protect our people and taking care of our people. Um, a response or any type of, you know, whether it's whether it's trades on the border in the northern border, um, you know, between Israel and Lebanon, um, or attacks on U.S. forces from Iran-backed militias, that has consequences on U.S. forces. And so, when I tell you that we're in consultations and discussions with the Israelis on that on our on their response, that's what I mean. Okay, and then on the uh, Iranian response to the assassination of Haniya in Tehran, which is shooting 200 missiles. According to Israeli media, uh, these missiles were targeting military infrastructure, and they hit three air bases, not civilian infra infrastructure. So is your assessment that the Iranians were after civilian infrastructure in Israel? And what precisely are you talking about? Which civilian infrastructure are you talking about? I said innocent civilians. Yeah, in, in and I just said infrastructure. I'd say broadly speaking, our assessment is that um, some of the ballistic missiles were targeting uh, military infrastructure, but, you know, for for a greater assessment, um, yeah, you know, I'd refer you to the Israelis to speak to that. Ultimately, the intent and target of that missile, Iran would have to speak to, because they're the ones putting in the coordinates. Um, we can only judge the trajectory and where they landed and or finally, where they were shot out of the sky. Finally, thank you for responses. Mm -hmm. you, you, you answered the um, question about your support for the so-called limited operation and southern Lebanon, which is to protect the uh, Israeli, uh, you know, uh, civilians on, on that border. And, mm -hmm. well, we know Hezbollah in their arsenal have missiles that can be launched from tens of kilometers away from the border. So how does that operation make any sense if the uh, intended or uh, effect or impact or goal is to prevent Hezbollah from launching those attacks? Along that border and some of that infrastructure are C2 nodes and, you know, storage facilities that um, the Israelis' military, you know, uh, and understandably uh, feels the need to eliminate in order to get, you know, their population um, back into the north. And this is not just for the protection of Israeli citizens. These are also, you know, Lebanese citizens that live on the other side of the border um, to allow for, you know, them to live in safety free from Hezbollah as well. So the Israelis are trying to protect Lebanese civilians? I think they are certainly trying. I, I'm not going to characterize, you know, uh, all of their operations, but they've been pretty clear that they want to see their people move back into the, into the northern communities, and they are conducting limited operations along that borderline. Charlie. Yes, Sabrina, <clears throat> we're all sort of referring to the same thing, and you had mentioned consequences. This is where conversations with Iran, uh, of what the Israelis may do with Iran, is different than what they've done unannounced in places like Lebanon. Because just looking at the geography, you've got Israel, you've got Iran, you've got a U.S. footprint kind of between them. It will have consequences mm -hmm. for U.S. forces. Has there been any change in terms of posture or readiness or alertness? Have you seen any activity by Iranian-backed militias? Have you seen the Houthis activating in any way? Um, so no change to our posture or readiness. Um, you know, I'll remind you that, uh, as you said, uh, we have forces throughout the region. Any type of action has... Uh, potential impacts for our forces wherever they might be stationed. Um, in terms of, 
you know, Houthis or IMG groups in, you know, Syria and Iraq. Um, you know, I, I think as of most recently, you know, the Houthis have continued to target commercial ships in the Red Sea. Um, you know, we have seen from the almost the beginning, I think since October 17th, you know, sustained periods of attacks on U.S. forces from these groups in Iraq and Syria. But I don't have anything recent to point to you on, as if that's what the question was. But we certainly have continued to see activity. Um, and, you know, we always reserve the right to defend ourselves. And um, that's what our forces will do in the region if attacked. You haven't seen any uptick in that region? I mean, could you give me something specific that you're referencing, or is there like a specific date? Because we saw a sustained period since October 17th. When Iran launched the largest mm -hmm. ballistic missile attack that Israel has ever seen, um, it, it didn't activate any of its proxies uh, to perhaps take a, a poke at U.S. forces in the region at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd don't have anything for you on that. I mean, we if if our forces are attacked or if there is something in the vicinity that, you know, could land on the base, our forces have the authority, like the ability to shoot it down and they'll take the measures needed to protect themselves. But I don't have any, I don't, there was no, as far as I'm aware, there was not a coordinated attack that Iran la launched its ballistic missile attack and then also coordinated with its proxy groups. I'm not tracking that there was a coordination there. Yeah. Thank you, Sabrina. Mm -hmm. uh, due to the increasing tensions in Lebanon, you deployed new reinforcements uh, to the region, mostly from the Air Force. Uh, do you use the air bases in Cyprus for those? And you were monitoring the latest attack of Iran uh, on Israel. Uh, and in, in your reconnaissance, when you uh, found out the attack is starting, did you use the bases in uh, Cyprus as well? So I'm just not going to speak to our basing options and where our aircraft are located. Constantine. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, following up on sort of Jen's line of questioning from earlier, um, so the destroyers in helping to repel this attack fired off 12 interceptor missiles. You know, granted, I'm sure these destroyers can get resupplied, but uh, um, if this were a more prolonged conflict, does the Department of Defense feel confident in its supply chain to be able to provide you know, more mi interceptor missiles in a longer term conflict? I think you've seen the secretary uh, made the make the commitment to, you know, of course, always taking into account U.S. forces and the protection of U.S. forces, but um, also the commitment to defend Israel. Um, when it comes to the supply chain, um, you know, there's certainly that is cer the defense industrial base is certainly being pressure tested, and we saw that from Ukraine. Um, so, you know, we're still confident in our abilities. We're still confident that we'll be able to, to resupply. Um, but I will point you to the fact that we've had delays in funding from Congress that haven't allowed us to backfill our shelves, um, which delay, which, you know, impact what can go out um, into our different AORs. And, you know, of course, um, that has an impact on the mission. Um, those are all things that the secretary thinks about when he makes these decisions and when um, carrier strike groups are moved, um, you know, different air, uh, different squadrons are moved into the region. Um, so to answer your question, you know, we're going to do what we need to do. And we believe that we have the capabilities that we need to defend our forces. Um, but when it comes to the defense industrial base, we've seen that from Ukraine, especially um, that the base is catching up and, you know, we still have a, a, a backlog and, it doesn't help that also we're operating under a CR. So yeah. uh -huh. just to sort of follow up on that. Sure. So is there any truth to sort of the this criticism that any missile fired in the, in defense of Israel or Central Command takes away from Admiral Paparo and the the notion of defending against China in the Indo-Pacific? No. I mean, every COCOM, um, you know, there are different mission requirements. I think you have to also remember um, as a planning organization, uh, while we didn't, you know, we didn't see October 7th and that, that attack, you know, like th um, what happened on October 7th was absolutely devastating and, you know, wasn't something that was built into the department's plans. Uh, we plan for a range of, you know, crises all around the world, um, whether it be, you know, Hurricane Helene um, or, uh, you know, it doesn't, I mean, events all around the world, the department is able to surge resources and move capability at a rapid pace, which I think is, um, shows the, you know, quite frankly, the power of the United States military. Um, 
of course, that's going to impact us down the line, but we're able to make those adjustments. And that's something that, um, you know, the secretary considers in every decision that he makes. And of course, with the consultation of the chairman and other departments in this building. Noah. Have the two remaining fighter squadrons arrived in CENTCOM yet? Or are they still in transit? Um, I'm only tracking that uh, only the squadron, only one squadron has arrived. So I'd refer you to CENTCOM for more on that. Secondarily, do you have a more specific number of U.S. forces that are in CENTCOM right now other than a few thousand above 40,000? I don't. I'm sorry, Noah. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to the phones and I'll come back in the room here. Uh, Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Thank you. When you say the U.S. And, and Israel are consulting, are both sides working collaboratively to come up with a list of targets that Israel should strike? Yeah. Thanks, Jeff, for the question. I'm just not going to be able to provide more details on what those conversations look like, um, other than that we are in close coordination and consultation with our Israeli counterparts. Uh, Laura Seligman, Wall Street Journal. Hey, Sabrina. My question is, has, does Secretary Austin support an Israeli strike on Iran's oil fields or its nuclear facilities? Yeah, thanks, Laura, for the question. I'm just not going to get into hypotheticals or speculate on what an Israeli response could look like, other than to say that we continue to talk with them about a potential response. Uh, last question on the phone. I believe it's Patrick Tucker, Defense One. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Sabrina. I, I, I probably know the answer to this, but uh, can you comment on reports that Israel has bombed a Russian air base in Syria? And following up on that, the Defense Department has shown that it's willing to take preemptive kinetic action against Houthi militants that are preparing to stage missile attacks against Israeli targets or targets in the Red Sea. Would that same policy apply to Russian forces that are uh, clearly preparing to stage attacks against Israel or other targets in the region, or would they get a slightly different policy, even if they're engaging in the same preparatory strike action? Uh, thanks, Patrick, for your question. So I'm not tracking uh, the strike that you uh, referenced in Syria. So, um, you know, I, I just don't have anything to add on that. Um, the actions that we take uh, in the Red Sea are defensive in nature. Um, and when, you know, U.S. forces are threatened or um, there is a threat to commercial shipping, um, you know, that's why the secretary stood up Operation Prosperity Guardian. Um, it is in self-defense and it is a coalition that has come together of like-minded nations um, to combat that Houthi threat. i um, not going to speculate on, you know, other threats down the line. Um, this department, as you have seen, can make adjustments at any time all over the world. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. Happy to come. Yeah. Oh, Thank you. Uh, so today, President Zelensky urged NATO allies to help intercept Iranian missiles and drones over Ukraine as they uh, do with Israel. Can the United States and allies help Ukraine with that? I mean, since it's possible with Israel, why can I help with Ukraine? Um, so uh, thank you for the question. Uh, you know, while I, while I appreciate the question, we are talking about two very different uh, landscapes and battlefields. Um, the president at the very beginning of when Russia invaded Ukraine has directed this department to provide Ukraine what it needs on the battlefield. They have been very successful in employing, whether it be air defenses or other capabilities to continue to take back their territory. Um, the secretary just had a call with Mr. Romerov, getting that battlefield update, getting to better understand what other capabilities they might need, if any. Um, the president has made a commitment that, you know, the United States is not putting boots on the ground in, into Ukraine, um, but we are supporting Ukraine in their efforts to take back their sovereign territory. Well, shooting like those targets, say from Polish or Romanian territory, would that be putting <coughs> boots on the ground? That would be in, involving us in, in a war in, the, in a different way. And right now we feel that Ukraine has been able to successfully defend um, against you know, Russian strikes to their um, to their cities, to their populations, to their infrastructure, um, and we're going to continue to make sure that they have the support that they need to do that. Separately, one more uh, on the F-16 training for Ukraine of those 18 additional pilots. Do you have any time frame for that? Uh, will it begin this year, next year? Any details? I don't have any time frame for you on that. Um, as you know, one of the requirements for pilot training is um, a. a proficiency in the English language. So, um, you know, once those pilots are trained and, and ready, um, you know, we will start working with them, but I just don't have a, an update or timeline for you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, 
So I have two questions. First, if Iran failed in its, uh, its attack on Israel, what's the logic behind a response from Israel? And do you believe that an Israeli attack on Iran is imminent? Look, we're continuing to consult with them. So um, in terms of something imminent, uh, that remains to be seen. Um, Iran did fail in its attack against Israel, but I think it's important to put it into co context that they launched nearly 200 ballistic missiles towards Israel. Um, you know, Israel has a right to respond to that. Um, I'm going to leave it at that. And, uh, <laughs> lastly, Iran used Iraqi airspace uh, to launch its missile towards uh, Israel. To your knowledge, any missiles intercepted in Iraq? And if I may add, you have enough, enough airspace, uh, enough defense capabilities in Iraq, not just to defend your forces, but to uh, respond to Iranian missiles if uh, uh, launched on, Iraq, on Israel. We have deep air defense capability in Iraq. Um, in terms of anything that was shot down over Iraqi airspace, um, the U.S. engagement when it came to the attack on October 1st came from our two destroyers in the Eastern Med. So anything shot down in the air um, or over Iraqi airspace, I'd refer you to the Israeli government to speak to that. Yes, in the back. Thank you. Uh, President of Ukraine Zelensky said today that uh, the West is dragging out long-range missile supplies. Is U.S. dragging out long-range missile <coughs> supplies? No, what I would say is we have a limited supply of long-range missiles, and we can on only a, a few nations have that supply, whether it be um, ATACM, Storm Shadows, Scalp, you know, you name it. Um, they are limited in their supply. Um, so, you know, we're not dragging it out. I think, in fact, you've seen this administration, um, this building, be very committed to making sure Ukraine gets get gets what it needs to defend itself. Um, but you are talking about interceptors that, um, you know, we have a limited amount on our shelves. And so um, we also have to always assess our own readiness whenever we make decisions when it comes to presidential drawdown packages or USAIs, which are long term. Um, and that's what, you know, the sec that's the secretary's in, in his mind. He's always assessing our readiness and what US forces need. Goyal. Thank you, Anna. Two mm -hmm. questions, please. One, uh, India's foreign minister was here meeting with the Secretary of uh, State during the time, at the same time when uh, Iranian missiles went on Israel or attacking Israel. So my question is here that India have also, of course, good relations with Iran and as well as with the Middle East countries and all that. If uh, Secretary of Defense or anybody from the department have spoken with him or met with him uh, to bring uh, uh, some kind of peace or uh, India can help uh, in the Middle East or uh, between uh, Russia and Ukraine or now Iranian missile attack? I don't have any conversations to read out from um, Secretary Austin um, and, uh, you know, any country that wanted to, you know, work to de-escalate tensions in the region, we certainly welcome that. Mm -hmm. Second one, as far as uh, Bangladesh is concerned, Bangladesh uh, uh, interim prime minister, Mr. Yunus Mohammed, was also at the United Nations, of course, and also met President Biden. Uh, any role the DOD or Def Defense Department playing as far as Bangladesh situation is concerned there, or uh, bring the new prime minister or elections and uh, ongoing discussion as far as uh, U.S. and Bangladesh military to military relations. I'm not tracking any DOD involvement. I would refer you to the State Department for more. Um, I think that's happening more at the, in the diplomatic channels. I'll come back. I just okay. we'll keep going around and then happy to come back here. Yes. Thank you. And Thank you then go to Lily. Um, yeah. uh, as we mentioned that you are engaging on discussions with the Israeli about um, what their response to Iran. Mm -hmm. um, did you get any uh, commitment from the Israeli that any actions that will take it against Iran will not lead to a wider war, which is your concerns, of course? So um, I'm not going to go into more details on the conversations, but what I will tell you is what we stress publicly and privately is that we don't want to see a wider regional conflict. So you can absolutely assume that that is something that is brought up in every conversation um, with Minister Gallant or, you know, across this administration. 
Mm -hmm. My last question, um, uh, regarding what's going on now at the border of Lebanon, um, uh, how long do you believe, uh, as the OD with their assessment, uh, Israel need to achieve their goals? Is, is it like uh, months? Or we can maybe see like what's happened in Gaza is still like over uh, almost about a, a year and we see the wars is still going on there. That's up to Israel to define, uh, to define what their strategic objectives and goals are. They've laid that out in terms of they want to allow citizens to return safely to their homes on that northern border region. But how those strategic objectives are met um, from a military means, that's for them to define. Just as we don't define success um, you know, for Ukraine either, that is for them to define for themselves. So um, in terms of strategic goals being met, I'd refer you to Israel to speak more to that. Louis. Uh, totally different question. Wow, okay. Let me, I'm, I'm gonna give you a break here. Um, <laughs> You're gonna ask something that I'm gonna have to take, aren't you? <laughs> I'm hoping you can, hoping you can answer this. Um, Yesterday, uh, there was an announcement of the deployment of a thousand active duty uh, yeah. forces for Hurricane Helene relief, which you noted in your topper. Um, can you tell us what the progress is? Uh, we know they're coming from the 18th Airborne, we know they're coming from the 82nd Airborne. Yeah. What exactly is their role? How will they work with uh, guardsmen? Are they complementary? Are they on their own? And I know they fall under this, the, the tag, but I mean, can you just explain to us what it is actually they're going to do? Sure. So um, the secretary authorized their movement of nearly a thousand um, active duty um, soldiers. Their their role is that they're going to fit into the larger apparatus, which is being led by FEMA and the North Carolina government. Um, so between I'm sorry, or NG, NGB, North Carolina National Guard. So between those entities, you know, the they're going to work with them to ensure that um, the, the North Carolina communities, wherever these soldiers go, are supported. And some of their, you know, some of the things that they're going to be doing is delivery of food and water and other critical aid. Um, I believe this is something that's still being, you know, worked on exactly where they will be. But as you know, they're in state. Um, they're ready to go. Um, you know, we, we're going to continue to work with the federal, local, and state level officials to ensure that, you know, they're fitting in where the need is the most critical. So, so the North Carolina has already activated 1,000 guardsmen to assist with this. Mm -hmm. It was the thinking that these 1,000, additional 1,000 active duty personnel uh, would bring capabilities that they don't have right now. Yes, and augment as well. My understanding is that uh, they bring they bring additional capabilities. I think certainly, you know, uh, the National Guard has its own capabilities, but these will aug augment those. Um, and I think, as we're all seeing some of the devastation, um, you know, roads, bridges, it's not easy to access. So this is another, you know, uh, group of uh, men and women that can go in with an amazing capability that will augment the National Guards and help get... Um, you know, critical need in, um, and also support, you know, uh, getting into isolated communities where it's even harder. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Jen. So a follow up on what Louie sure. asked, have those 1,000 active duty troops from Fort Liberty arrived on the scene in North Carolina? Are they working yet? Um, not to my knowledge. Um, I believe that that is still being worked with um, the state. So for more on when they actually depart, you know, I'd refer you to FEMA for, for more on their efforts. What is taking so long? They are a couple of hours away from Asheville where they don't have mm -hmm. helicopters to get in. It seems a little strange that the 82nd Airborne can't deploy a little faster. I think they are, they're, they're, they're certainly ready to go. They're, they've been authorized. Um, it's more a matter of making sure that the state and FEMA um, are ready to, uh, you know, knit them in to the structure that's in place. Um, the last thing you want to do is have a bunch of people show up and kind of, you know, uh, exacerbate the system any, ev even more. Um, they're authorized. Uh, they're ready to go. But it, it is ultimately the state's call on, on, on when and how they, they, are, they are moved into the state. I'm going to come back and then, yes, go ahead. Hi. Hi, Jessica with News Nation. Yeah, hi, nice to see you. Hi. <laughs> um, some military bases were impacted due to the hurricane. I was just wondering if you have a timeline as to how soon they might be back up and running. Um, some military bases, you mean in terms of evacuation? Yes, some of the troops were. Yes. Yeah. So there were uh, precautionary measures taken to evacuate some of our, our bases and um, and move our people out due to the storm. Um, 
I don't have a timeline on when folks will be able to go back to those bases. That's obviously an assessment that the commander would make. Um, so for you know each each base that you're interested in, I'd, I'd probably reach out to the base itself or Northcom. But I just don't I don't have those details and timelines in front of me. Sorry. Joseph, Do you have any yeah. updates on the Truman, um, where it's going to deploy, and does the Secretary have any plans to call for another two aircraft carrier or strike groups to be in the Middle East? So right now, I don't have more than what Sixth Fleet had announced, and that um, you know the Truman will be continuing into the UCOM AOR. I think uh, probably participating in an exercise um, soon. Um, the secretary always reserves the right uh, to to change her orders, but right now she's continuing as planned. Okay, one more. Okay, yes. Just kind of adding to Luis's question, um, how common is it for active duty soldiers to participate in disaster response? Is this a, a new thing or in disasters of past, has that been pretty common? No, we, you've seen um, participation of, of active duty. I, I don't have, a, I will be honest, I don't have a full rundown uh, of for you here, um, but I think in 2018 was when Maybe the 18th was activated um, for a response. Um, it's not uncommon. It's on the needs on the state, um, and of course, what you know the local and state leaders assess what they need, and in consultation with NGB. Um, but it is common. It's what you know they can be used for a range of, um, you know, whether it be a, a crisis in a different part of the world or a national disaster, um, natural disaster, I should say. Um, you know. They are there to help support their communities. And um, so it's it's not uncommon is, is my bottom line is what I'm trying to say. Okay, thanks everyone.